Hi, I'm Sarah, and this is CAR T-Cells Beyond the Basics. Before we get started, a few quick disclaimers. I do own a CAR T-Cell company, and some of our assets will be discussed throughout this presentation. This slide deck is intended for educational purposes only. Unless otherwise noted, all of the assets discussed herein are considered to be investigational. The data and case studies included in this presentation are the result of what I would call cherry picking and pattern, pattern recognition. That is to say that they are not the result of a proper meta-analysis. Please keep that in mind as we go through this slide deck. Trademarks, trade dress, patents, copyrights, and pending patent applications are the property of their respective owners. Here's a brief outline of the topics that we are going to discuss today. So first we're going to look at some select challenges for solid tumors. We're then going to discuss the translational relevance of animal models and look at some case studies. We're also going to look at some noteworthy car designs. Before getting into the quality realm and looking at some manufacturing process changes, and lastly, before wrapping up, we'll look at some novel, novel business and manufacturing models. So first, let's get into some select challenges for solid tumors. Since many of my peers have spoken quite extensively about the issue of exhaustion, and given the opportunity to redose, I won't be spending too much time talking about exhaustion. So first, we'll look at the outline for these select challenges for solid tumors. There's obviously the issue of trafficking homing. It's just inefficient, and this is really important for systemically infused CAR T cells. Remember that in the solid tumors, the contact with tumor antigen may be quite different than the blood cancers. And if you're not doing a direct route of administration, it may be a while before those CAR T cells reach their intended destination, if they reach it at all. There's also the issue of the impenetrable tumor stroma, and that kind of plays directly into the next issue, which is the immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. And the last challenge that we're briefly going to look at today is the challenge of relapses, which really I, I feel can be anticipated given everything we've learned about CAR T cells from the blood cancers. So first, let's look at the inefficient trafficking and homing issue. The first issue, or shall I say major barrier to T-cell trafficking homing, is a mismatch between the cognate chemokine ligand and its receptor. And this is an interaction that's required for efficient T-cell trafficking or homing. There's also the downregulation of adhesion molecules like ICAM-1, and of course the aberrant vasculature. I will be referencing a lot of different papers throughout this presentation, and I've included the references at the bottom of each slide, so I hope that you will check some of those out. Additionally, in these pink boxes are some key discussion topics that I hope will facilitate some additional conversations after this presentation. This first key discussion topic has to do with the local route of administration and whether that's going to be enough to overcome this trafficking or homing barrier in solid tumor applications specifically. The next issue that we'll briefly be discussing is the impenetrable tumor stroma. The stroma is, of course, composed of the extracellular matrix, stromal cells, which include the fibroblasts, and additional immune cells, including myeloid-deprived suppressor cells. In addition to serving as a physical barrier to the trafficking of immune cells, the stroma can also be a source of immunosuppressive signals. Overcoming the tumor stroma, as I said, is definitely a challenge. Tumor cell lysis requires the formation of the immune synapse. And secreted cytokines can sensitize the stroma in one of three pathways by which CARs mediate cytotoxicity. Again, references that pertain to this slide can be seen on the bottom of this slide. 
The tumor microenvironment, of course, poses a challenge to CAR T cells being developed for solid tumor indications. T cells can become dysfunctional within the TME. As you can see, most of the dysfunctional T cell classifications are undesirable and may be the result of a suboptimal T cell population, of persistent overstimulation, or the result of repetitive stimulation. That's perhaps something to keep in mind when thinking about tonic signaling, for example. It's not all bad news, however. One of the dysfunctional T cell classifications is actually desirable. And so I think it's really important to start thinking about how we mold and manipulate the tumor environment to create an environment that is actually beneficial for the adaptive T cells, whether they're CARs, TCRs, or TILs. So next we'll just briefly discuss um, the relapses. Of course you can have your relapses where you don't lose um, the expression of the tumor associated antigen that you're targeting. Um, those are the relapses that are due to T cell failure. Um, more commonly, I think, or at least um, we hear more about, are the relapses that are either associated with antigen loss, antigen downregulation, or antigen silencing. And I kind of like to clump all these together in um, the category of relapses due to antigen modulation. Now, there's definitely some um, different approaches to addressing this problem dual targeting and other multi-specific uh, CAR T cells is one way that um, people and entities, including my own company, are exploring in terms of overcoming this challenge. Uh, but also on my radar, and I think is definitely worth discussing uh, in depth further after this talk, would be the use of radiation-based preconditioning and the role that that type of preconditioning modality might have in mitigating these types of uh, relapses due to antigen modulation. There's a growing body of evidence um, that I think is, is really compelling, and I would encourage everybody to take a look at that. I included some references in the pink box on this slide, and like I said, I really encourage everybody to take a look at some of those papers. And of particular note for the solid tumor world is the fact that a lot of these later stage patients are already receiving radiation for palliative purposes. So um, the idea of, of using this preconditioning regimen that would be radiation based is really quite compelling in that the overlap with the palliative care and also you're potentially avoiding some of the toxicities that may be involved with um, your more commonly seen preconditioning regimens such as your um, cyclophosphamide or fludarabine based preconditioning. So the next topic that we'll briefly look at is the topic of translational relevance of animal models and sort of I want to discuss more broadly the use of animal models in um, IND or investigational new drug enabling research. And I would like to point out um, first that this is an issue that was completely not even on my radar until I received pre-pre-IND written feedback from the FDA. And it was that feedback that kind of launched me on this journey into learning a lot more about the issue. And so I thought I would share some of what I've learned. So first, I would just like to point out that in the context of IND enabling research, you know, we really do animal studies for two reasons. The first reason is to demonstrate safety in vivo prior to testing in humans. This, of course, assumes that the model is of translational relevance and that the target is expressed in the relevant species or that an animal homologue exists. The second reason is to determine the dose to be used for the first in human clinical trial. 
However, typically speaking, you look at the 10 to the 9 to the 10 to 11 range for the solid tumor cars in the first in human trials that have been tested in traditionally 3x3 three three designs. So the key discussion topic that pertains to this slide really has to do with the question of whether or not animal models faithfully recapitulate humans and whether or not safety testing in a mouse is relevant to determine safety signals in humans. And so we're going to look in a few slides at a few case examples. But first, I would like to just briefly introduce you to the concept of the three R's. Again, this is a topic that was really not even on my radar until the FDA put it on my radar. And the concept was first introduced back in 1959 in a book called The Principles of Humane Experimental Technique. And the first R uh, deals with refinement. So the refinement of in vivo studies and animal models. The second R stands for reduction. So in that case, you're looking to reduce the number of animal models used. And finally, the third R stands for replacement. And this is where you actually replace animal studies with a suitable alternative or alternatives. And I have provided on this slide um, just some examples of each of the three R's, just for your reference. This slide includes some case studies in which fatalities were actually seen in the mice that were tested prior to first in human clinical trials. And I won't go into each one of these in great detail. Um, I did, again, include the references uh, below. But as you can see on this slide, uh, anti-CD19 CAR T cells do appear. And there was this case where lethal toxicities were observed in the murine model. Um, and it was determined that the mouse strain can have a big impact on the toxicity in the murine models. Now, as I'm sure many of you know, all three of the FDA-approved CAR T cells target CD19. And although they are generally considered to be safe and efficacious by the FDA, all three do have black box warnings for cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity. Uh, we won't be getting into those issues in, in detail in this presentation, but it is just worth noting that those black box warnings do exist. On this slide, we see some case studies in which the Toxicities that were observed in human research subjects on clinical trials were not anticipated by the preclinical testing done in animal models. Um, again, I've linked all the applicable references down below. I would like to point out for the anti-CEA CAR T cell example that this is an interesting example in that it may highlight the importance of the binding domain selection in that the first generation CAR T cells that were tested in the UK um, actually ended up being shelved and the trial was terminated due to toxicity, whereas a second generation anti-CEA CAR T cell construct um, from which the binding domain comes from a different source, those CAR T cells have been rather successfully tested in um, trials here in the U.S. And by successfully, I'm talking about the safety profile. So we haven't seen any uh, fatalities, to the best of my knowledge, on those trials with second-generation anti-CEA CAR T cells from which um, the binding domain was derived from the humanized MN14 monoclonal antibody. A few final points that I would like to make within the context of the translational relevance of animal models. So first, and this is actually a really important point, if you are, if you are a group that does go to the FDA to seek advice prior to testing in animals, you can propose animal studies and even if FDA thinks it's completely unethical to be doing this large animal trial 
or animal study, um, it's not part of their mandate to actually explain that to you. So the, the consequence of that is that there could potentially be a lot of people doing animal testing that really isn't necessary for the purposes of FDA marketing approval, or at least uh, getting your IND through the FDA without a clinical hold. But again, because FDA's mandate doesn't include ethics, they are pretty much in a bind, and that is to say that aside from encouraging the application of the 3R principles that we briefly discussed earlier, uh, there's not much they can say if you are planning to or have already done large animal studies that may or may not be required for regulatory purposes. Um, the other and final point that I would like to make here is that it has been my experience thus far that peer reviewers really just are not yet comfortable with seeing applications that deal with innovative uh, approaches that attempt to bypass the use of animal models. And, um, you know, your academic PIs, they may have never had a regulatory interaction, and so um, this issue may be one that's just not on their radar. For the NIH R01 awards, which are, you know, pretty heavily used by academic PIs, um, you know, I would argue that animal studies are, are almost expected on those awards. I think the latest stat that I saw was that 40% of NIH-funded R01s include murine models. So whether or not it's needed for regulatory purposes, there seems to be this expectation that you will use animal models um, at some point in your innovation spectrum. And again, it may not be ethical, but it's not FDA's place to say that it's not ethical, or at least, you know, that's not their mandate. And lastly, I would say that as part of peer review, there's no real evaluation as to whether or not the animal studies proposed are actually required for regulatory purposes. That may not be applicable to basic science, but when you're talking about developing therapies, and I think that's highly applicable to NIH ICs like the NCI um, that like to fund, you know, cancer therapies, it, it's a relevant point. Um, I would like to point out, however, that the FDA is not the only regulator that entities like my own have to deal with. Um, there's, of course, a number of them throughout the world, and it's not really clear yet how the other regulatory agencies may feel about the, you know, bypassing of animal studies and really not having a large amount of animal data in the dossiers that are prepared and ultimately submitted for marketing purposes abroad. So, um, I can tell you that it's something that this is an issue that I plan to address further uh, with the regulatory agencies, but um, we are not yet ready for our next interaction, so I can't exactly tell you when that will be. Um, but it is important to say that, you know, just because you can get your IND past the FDA without a clinical hold, without animal models, doesn't necessarily mean that you won't have issues down the road um, resulting from the fact that you have not done safety testing in animals. I would also like to point out, however, that if you're in clinical trials and you're talking to regulators about marketing applications and you have safety data from a phase one trial, you can argue, well, you know, why would I go back and do an animal study to enable a phase one trial that's already been completed. So there are definitely arguments to be made. And in my experience, um, as long as you can really justify what you're doing to the regulators, you're probably okay. But uh, I think this is an important point to note. And the other thing I would like to say here before we jump to the next topic is that uh, I think it's, it's not only the regulatory aspects that we have to look at because 
at least for the academic constructs and for, I think, for many of the early stage companies as well that are looking at investors, bringing on investors, um, I think there's an expectation um, for these animal studies to be done on the part of the the investors as well. So it's not just peer review in, in that context. I think you also have the issue showing up in terms of, like I said, um, investors looking for these data as well. So I, I think it's it's an issue that we need to discuss with many stakeholders, and we can't just limit this to you know academia or small businesses like my company. Um, it really is a pervasive one, and I would really like to see the field as a whole really um, prioritize the use of animal models better. So next we're just going to jump into some different car design considerations that I think are worth noting. And again, the case studies that follow are not the result of a proper meta-analysis. Um, especially with the, the next slide, and that's slide 17. Um, I would say pattern recognition is more applicable here in terms of the methodology used to identify cars on this slide. Uh, I won't go into each one of these individually. Again, I have provided the references for you on the bottom of the slide. But the question that I would like to ask here is, is targeting the membrane proximal region superior? So that is to say, are cars that target membrane proximal regions superior to cars that target membrane distal regions? I don't know the answer to that offhand, but I feel like we perhaps may be starting to see a bit of a pattern here. So I would definitely encourage you to check out some of the references in included on this slide and to let me know what your thoughts are and if you're starting to see a pattern like I feel may be emerging here. The next slide deals with the issue of affinity tuning uh, in the context of CAR T cells. And it may appear as though higher affinity cars don't really confer um, much of an advantage relative to their lower affinity counterparts. Um, at the very low affinity cars, you have to ask, does the extremely low affinity actually impede cytotoxicity? Uh, there's some case studies included on this slide on both low affinity cars um, very low affinity cars and high affinity cars. And again, you know, with the low affinity cars, um, does affinity tuning to lower um, the affinity, does that confer advantages to cars relative to higher affinity cars? You know, I don't know if we have all the answers to this, but I do think, again, that these are some compelling case studies. And if you're interested in looking at affinity tuning, as an optimization strategy, I would definitely encourage you to check out some of the references on this slide. This next slide includes case studies of cars being developed to specifically address the inability of CAR T cells to traffic or home to their solid tumor targets. Uh, again, I won't go into each one of these constructs individually. I would encourage you to read the papers listed on this slide as there's some really interesting papers in here. Uh, the five CAR T-cell constructs that appear in blue on this slide make up the CAR T-cell Bells and Whistles program here at SES. And that's a program that we've specifically designed to um, traffic or home to specific disease sites. So the first car you'll see with the L-selectin and CCR7 is specifically engineered to traffic our home to the lymph nodes. So we hope to test that car in nodal metastases. Um, each one of the cars in our Bells and Whistles program is specifically engineered for a different disease site. So going down the list from the lymph nodes, we then have the skin, the mucosa, the lungs, and the liver. So we do hope to be testing um, in METs at all of those disease sites at some point with our Bells and Whistles program.
Um, but again, there are some really interesting case studies, um, not just my own. So I would definitely encourage you to check some of those out. Um, you'll definitely notice there's a pattern in the transgene accessories that are being added to the cars in order to facilitate trafficking and homing. And I definitely think that's a good thing given um, that it is uh, a difficult hurdle to overcome, especially for solid tumors. So on this slide, we are seeing how toxins are being used in some noteworthy car designs. I think the one that you're probably most familiar with um, would be the anti-chlorotoxin car that's being developed by the City of Hope. Uh, it was licensed by a company out in Australia. And the purpose of the chlorotoxin in that construct is targeting. Um, we have a similar car being developed uh, for the anthrax toxin that I was able to find in a very recently published uh, patent application. And the construct that appears in blue text on this slide is again one of uh, our, my company here at uh, SES. And this car is uh, one of our newest cars. We call this our immunotoxic car. And we've uh, done something a little different with this car. We're not necessarily using the toxin here in a targeting sense, but rather we're trying to equip the car with an extra mechanism um, by which they can kill target cells or tumor cells in this case. Um, so here we have a cytolysin uh, conjugate on one of the binding domains. It's a dual targeting car. So in the dual targeting car, you've got two uh, binding domains. So one of them here has this um, cytolysin conjugate. And that's really designed, like I said, to hopefully deliver this immunotoxic payload um, in the solid tumor sense. I can tell you for a fact that we will be uh, massively expanding this program. Uh, while I do have absolute safety concerns um, when you're talking about adding immunotoxin to already potentially toxic CAR T cells, um, it, it is a potentially compelling approach. And the thing that I find really interesting is that as we swap out different toxins, um, they actually have different mechanisms of action. So if one group of toxins with one mechanism of action um, isn't successful, we can move on to try a t an immunotoxin with a different mechanism of action. And again, we're just trying to enhance the ability of the CAR T cells to um, kill tumor cells because that's really what we're we're what we're trying to do here. And um, lastly, on this slide, I just included um, the construct with the PD-1 blocking uh, SCFB, and that is a car being developed um, by MSKCC and Renier Brentjens et al. On this, the last slide of topic three, I just thought I would point out a few other cars that are being developed either to deal with the impenetrable tumor stroma or the hostile tumor microenvironment. So here you see your anti-FAP CAR T cells, your IL-12 engineered TILs, your IL-12 armored CAR T cells, uh, probably more commonly referred to as trucks. And lastly on this slide is one of the newer cars um, that has been talked about from the University of Pennsylvania, which is really a combination of cars and a PAC4 inhibitor um, that's really meant to deal with the tumor microenvironment. So again, uh, I encourage you to check out those references and to think about the cars that are being developed to specifically address um, the issues that we've discussed um, that are specifically challenging for solid tumor applications. So in this topic four, we're just going to very briefly touch on some manufacturing process change case studies. 
the first case study I'm sure most of you are familiar with in some regard, and that is the JCAR-015 case study, also known as kind of the rocket case study. And this is an anti-CD19 car um, that was developed at MSKCC and was in licensed by Juno, um, which is now part of Bristol-Myers Squibb. And the interesting thing about, well, the tragic thing about this case study is that there was a shift in neurotoxicity um, that was seen on the commercially sponsored phase two trial that was not anticipated by the academic phase one trial. And although we don't have a lot of information about the process change from the academic phase one to the commercial phase two, we have seen uh, Juno investigator um, at least partially blame um, the change in uh, raw materials going from institution source vector, for example, to commercial commercially source vector. Uh, this was I guess it provided as one of the reasons for this sh this shift in neurotoxicity. Ultimately, JCAR-015 was shelved. Um, and again, it's really interesting to note this case study when you think about the three FDA-approved CAR T cells that, again, all target CD19. You may know that um, all three of the FDA um, approved CAR T cells share the same uh, binding domain, that's the FMC63 domain, whereas the JCAR015 construct had a different uh, CD19 targeting domain. It was that uh, the SJ25C1, pardon me. Um, so you have to uh, ask yourself what role did binding, did the binding domain or perhaps the affinity of the binding domain play in um, the determination of the fact that the anti-CD19 CAR T cells with the SJ25C1 binding domain were not safe um, relative to all of the CARs being developed with the FMC63 binding domain of which three have been FDA approved already. And another one, uh, Liso cell or JCAR-017, is probably likely to be approved um, early in 2021. So it's, an, it's a very interesting case study um, in terms of both the car design and the manufacturing change. And again, I would like to say that um, although I do think the manufacturing change played a role in um, what happened in the rocket trial the, on the phase two side. Um, I don't think you can talk about JCAR-015 without mentioning um, the different binding domain relative to the FDA approved CAR T cells. Um, this next slide is a case study from Seattle Children's and uh, I don't know a ton about this case study but what I can tell you is that uh, they had attempted to switch bead manufacturers, um, I think likely to, to use the beads that um, work with the Prodigy system, and unfortunately they did not have a good uh, conversion to the new beads and ended up reverting back to the beads that they had used in the first version of their uh, manufacturing protocol. So this is a really interesting case study in that um, the process change ultimately failed and they ended up reverting back to the original manufacturer. Now for those of you who are on the commercial side of CAR T cells or at least aspire to be, you know that FDA really encourages us to have multiple sources for our you know, raw and ancillary uh, materials. And as you start to look at these case studies, you have to ask yourself, am I going to be able to find comparable, um, you know, secondary materials? I'm not so sure. Had you asked me before I saw these case studies, I really don't think I would have told you that this was going to be a big issue. 
I didn't think that switching beads would be consequential, but it turns out apparently it can be very consequential. And I think the other important point to make about these process changes are that these are process changes that are happening during the clinical phase of the innovation spectrum. And when you're making process changes during the clinical phase, it's pretty risky. So if you're looking to really mitigate these risks, I would argue that you need to have your manufacturing locked in before you start your first in human trial. And that requires a lot more work up front and quite frankly, a lot more funding up front. Um, but I think you gotta, you gotta spend more up front to ultimately de-risk. And I think that this is one compelling case study in that regard. Uh, this next case study is from the NCI, and this is another upstream, manu upstream manufacturing change. Here they tried to change from CD3, CD28 based enrichment to the CD4, CD8 selection um, in order to use the Prodigy devices. And what happened in this case study, and again, I would defer you to the paper that's been published as well as the YouTube videos that should be hyperlinked below, um, they ended up having to de-escalate the dose back down to um, what was considered to be um, the first dose level from the original manufacturing protocol. So that would be the one with the CD3 and the CD28 enrichment. So Again, here you are seeing um, clinical consequence of a process change made during the clinical phase of the innovation spectrum. And this is pretty common because you're typically seeing the tech transfer happen sometime during the course of early phase clinical trials. So it's not uncommon to see an academic phase one followed up by a commercial phase two. And many times the commercial phase two is going to have slightly different manufacturing or raw and ancillary materials than you had on that phase one. And that introduces risk. And it, you know, it can be riskier than I would have told you, that I would have guessed it had you asked me a year or two ago. Um, so I just would like to point out that, again, I would argue that a best practice would be to not uh, make major manufacturing changes between a phase one and phase two, even if you don't need to be locked in until phase two or your BLA, because it's just very risky. And there, there are consequences, is the bottom line. So this last uh, case study that I would like to point out is one that I know even less about than the other three. And this one is one that was just very recently disclosed at ASH, and I just happened to catch a tweet on it. Um, so what I will say is they did say that they changed the manufacturing from the escalation and expansion cohorts, the first part, to the um, expansion cohort, which was, you know, the, the second version of their manufacturing protocol. And as you can see here, um, there was a difference in the overall response rate um, for the same dose level following the manufacturing change. So in this regard, it ended up being beneficial um, for BB21217, which is a, a BCMA, well, it's a modified BCMA car um, being developed by Bluebird. And uh, although it worked out well for them, you know, again, I would argue that the earlier you optimize and are locked into your manufacturing, the better. Um, but on the flip side, if you're data are not really where you want them to be. And as you can see from this first version of their manufacturing protocol, that the overall response rate on that, um, you know, top dose level was only 57%, then perhaps a manufacturing change could be beneficial and could increase your overall response rate. But again, you know, I would, I would caution this, um, 
just anytime you're making a manufacturing process change during clinical trials, it can go either way. So the last topic we're going to discuss um, are just some novel business and manufacturing models. So first, I would just kind of like to briefly touch on the manufacturing models. Um, as many of you know, uh, the companies with FDA-approved CAR T cells have um, gone the centralized route. However, it's not without risk. Um, you are really subject to risk involved with shipping when you are doing centralized manufacturing. And I have at least uh, personally seen one case where a PI had to intervene to ensure that a delayed FedEx shipment uh, arrived on time so that the cells could be administered um, to the human research subject or patient. I don't know if it was an IND or one of the approved ones, so I don't know if human research subject or patient is the more correct term to use. Um, but regardless, uh, I can tell you for a fact that a PI did have to intervene, and that could have been a very bad situation, luckily. It all worked out. Um, however, it does highlight some of the issues with centralized manufacturing. Um, companies like mine are more interested in the decentralized approach. Um, but it, again, it's, it's not a perfect solution, especially when you're talking about the EU. They have different um, regulatory caveats in the EU, I guess we shall say. And for example, you may need what's called a QP or qualified person at each site um, in order to comply with the um, EMA regulations. Now, I would argue that you want a qualified person at each site regardless, but the fact of the matter is you may be um, subjecting yourself to additional regulatory burden if you're going for a decentralized approach. But then again, there are also benefits because you can avoid a lot of the, the costly and time-consuming shipping steps. And when you're talking about vein-to-vein -vein time, that could be very advantageous. Um, we've also seen kind of point-of-care manufacturing. That seems to be a little bit um, more popular with um, academics, academic trials um, doing the point-of-care manufacturing. And that is to say that it may not be as popular in the post-tech transfer space. However, I would keep an eye on Xiopharm in that regard, um, as I do think that, you know, they're one of the companies that is pioneering point-of-care manufacturing in conjunction with MDACC. So um, the key discussion topic here being, does the optimal manufacturing model depend on what type of cells you are making? Um, do, autologous cell, do autologous cells, um, are they better made under the decentralized manufacturing? I don't know. I would argue yes, but then again, I'm probably biased because I've made the choice to go decentralized. So keep that in mind. Um, it'll be interesting to see how all of this plays out and how, as more and more companies um, get closer to commercialization, what models they choose. I can tell you that I did see GSK say that they are going to go for the decentralized route, so that was pretty interesting. Um, in terms of intellectual property, whew, where do I start? Okay, so... I've noticed that a lot of people in the biomedical realm, and granted, I'm not trying to cast judgment because before I started my company, I knew basically nothing about intellectual property. So, um, I, you know, I understand. But a lot of times within the realm of, of bio, biomedical research, people do not understand really um, IP outside of patents. And, and that's fine. Um, I understand historically patents, you know, have been used to secure IP in the pharmaceutical industry. There's plenty of controversy about, you know, the gaming of the patent system um, in that regard. So I kind of just wanted to take a little bit of time to point out that, you know, 
in addition to trademarks, too, you do have trade secrets and, and copyrights. And especially as we see the car T-cell field really explode and the amount of patent filings explode, um, it becomes increasingly difficult to meet the thresholds of patentability, in my opinion, under Title 35 of the United States Code. Um, you know, you really need to introduce a, a novel element. And, you know, when you start to, to really look into some of these newer, newly published patent applications, you, just, you start to question whether or not the changes being made, you know, the novel elements in these designs, whether they're truly being made to benefit the car or just so that um, the inventors can secure IP rights. So it's a, you know, it's an interesting topic. Um, I had kind of just very briefly laid out some of the differences for you in a table that I modified from um, the National Heart, um, Lung, and Blood Institute. So thank you to them for that. And on this second slide here, I do want to bring up a point because, and you know, I, you can think back to the whole Theranos scandal um, in the context of, of this key discussion topic, but patent applications after the lag period are going to be published in their entirety. And in order for, apparently for your patent application to meet the threat, thresholds for patentability, you have to include everything, enough information so that somebody else can look at your patent and completely uh, you know, replicate what you have done. And you know, I wonder about the publication of patent applications in terms of the maintenance of secrecy in order to um, maintain trade secret as, as a form of intellectual property. And are you really kicking yourself in the behind if you file a patent application um, and it doesn't get filed because then you can't really claim trade secret because your patent I'm sorry, if your patent application isn't granted, um, you won't be able to then go back and say, well, you know, we're, we have this work protected under trade secret because you will have had this published patent application. Now, copyrights, on the other hand, copyrights, while there is a copyright catalog, all that's essentially published in the catalog is just basic information about the registration. So, you know, the company um, that registered it, the registration number, the effective date of registration. But what's really key to note um, in the context of copyrights is that the public cannot ever access that deposit copy. You do have to submit a deposit copy to the U.S. Copyright Office in order to secure registration, and you cannot sue for copyright infringement unless you have um, secured registration with the Copyright Office. There is case law that, that um, makes that so, um, even though technically speaking the copyright is created when you create the, the work. Um, that's a whole other topic for another day. But the point of the matter is the deposit copy that you have submitted to the U.S. Copyright Office is basically confidential. I mean, you can't get it. I, believe me, I asked them, uh, and it is confidential. So I, and I also make a, an extra point when I'm registering works with the Copyright Office um, that are proprietary and are confidential to make a note of that on the application of, about the deposit copy. Um, so that there's no way that it can ever be discovered under the Federal Freedom of Information Act or any other act for that matter. Um, I'm not an attorney. This is not business advice, but I would like to facilitate some more discussions about how um, other forms of IP can be used to secure IP rights, um, especially for companies um, that are very early stage that may not have everything that is needed to um, get data to file for a patent application. Or, and maybe they don't want to file for a patent application. Um, you know, there, there are reasons maybe that, again, you don't want to do that, such as the maintain, 
the maintenance of um, the trade secret. So I just wanted to point all that out. I would like everyone to kind of think a little bit more in depth about that, and I would really love to have discussion about um, the different forms of IP and how um, you know claiming one form can potentially impede upon your ability to claim another form, etc. Okay, well, we're just about done, and the last thing that I really want to touch upon, and anybody who knows me is going to say, Sarah, you are a broken record and guilty as charged, um, but we need to talk about affordability. So, um, you know, the, the current price tags of the FDA-approved CAR T-cells are, you know, to put it bluntly, astronomical, and, you know... It was really these these prices were really negotiated based on the thinking that it, they were going to be single dose treatments, and we know that they are not single dose treatments. But yet the pricing has not ever been adjusted to reflect the fact that they're really not single dose treatments. And that's not to say that we don't want everyone to have a response like Emily Whitehead. Of course, that's that's the goal. Um, but especially in, in the solid tumor world, we're not there yet. So I think we need to think incrementally about how we get there. And I know most of us now that are developing CAR T cells in the solid tumor world are planning on multiple doses from the get-go. Um, but we have to think about what strain we are going to put on the healthcare system for my generation and for the subsequent generations when these CAR T cells cost you know, the equivalent of a mortgage. Um, you know, my company has, has been very vocal about the fact that um, this is not sustainable and we are doing everything we can to foster affordability. My concern in terms of some of our competitors is that they are doing a lot to bring their cost of goods down and then won't necessarily... Um, you know, pass those savings along to the payer or the consumer. So, um, you know, I, I, I put my company on the slide. I've also put this um, new company that we're seeing out of India that, that has um, at least publicly claimed that affordability is a central tenet of their business, and I certainly hope that's, that's correct. Um, but again, you know, we were just talking about IP, and there's obviously IP issues that factor into, um, you know, who can operate in the CAR T cell world without infringing and et cetera. Um, but to my competitors, please, we need to focus on affordability. It's up to us. And if we do not do something, this is going to place an enormous strain on my generation and those to come. And while I have your attention, I have to make that point. Thank you. We've reached the conclusion. So in closing, I would just like to make the following points. The challenges for CAR T cells being developed for solid tumors require unique multi-pronged approaches. The heavy reliance on animal models of questionable translational relevance remains. CAR designs are evolving to address one or more of the specific challenges covered herein. CMC process changes may not be inconsequential. And there are novel business and manufacturing models that are emerging and may ultimately help facilitate affordability. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. All of my 